Hello and welcome. I'm Roger Ream, and this is the Liberty and Leadership Podcast, a conversation with TFAS alumni, supporters, faculty, and friends who are making a real impact in public policy, business, philanthropy, law, and journalism. Today I'm joined by Dr. Rachel Ferguson. Dr. Ferguson is an esteemed scholar and author and co-author with Marcus Witcher of the book, Black Liberation Through the Marketplace, Hope, Heartbreak, and the Promise of America, which discusses the history and successes of black Americans. Dr. Ferguson is in Washington, D.C. today to deliver the annual Lev Dobriansky Lecture on Political Economy to our TFAS summer students. She will be discussing the themes of her new book with our academic director, Ann Bradley, tonight. Today, it's my pleasure to talk with Dr. Ferguson about the same subject as well as some other topics. Well, good afternoon, Dr. Ferguson. It's good to be with you. Uh, As I mentioned in my introduction, uh, you'll be giving the Lev Dobriansky lecture tonight. Uh, This is a very special program uh, that we've been sponsoring for more than 25 years. I think the first person to give the lecture was uh, Dr. James Buchanan. Oh, wow. Uh, We've had had Gordon. (laughs) I'm honored. (laughs) Well, uh, we've had Gordon Tullock and uh, Bill Easterly and Walter Williams and Mansur Olson uh, in the early years. And and we've continued this tradition. Lev Dobriansky was someone very important to us. He was a longtime professor at Georgetown University and and was our founding director of our first program in 1970 and stayed with us until the 80s when he was appointed the U.S. ambassador to, of all places, the Bahamas by President Reagan. Wow. Not, not a bad place to be <laughs> nice. the ambassador, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, but he's an important person, and we've continued this lecture in his name. Uh, well, uh, I know you'll be talking about some of these topics uh of your book uh, tonight, Black Liberation Through the Marketplace. It's an outstanding book, published in 2022. And uh, what was the motivation behind writing this book? I think the main motivation is that, you know, Marcus and I are both very serious classical liberal scholars. We've been in the liberty movement all our adult lives. And um, as someone who was, you know, living very near Ferguson, Missouri, getting involved with helping the entrepreneurs there to rebuild their businesses after the unrest and things like that, I thought, you know, those of us who are in the movement actually know about all these amazing classical liberal insights into issues of race and discrimination. Gary Becker's point, right, the stuff about zoning, the stuff about property rights. We are aware of all of this, but no one's put it together in one place. And so when people think about race and discrimination, they immediately think of the left. The left cares about this and other people don't, right? Libertarians don't or conservatives don't. And we wanted to say, no, actually we have a ton, right? We have a ton of of work on this, but we didn't necessarily host conferences called, you know, liberty and race and discrimination. And so by putting it all together in one book, we tried to show there's a really strong classical liberal stand for the rights of minorities, including black Americans. And it's made a big difference in the history of black lives. Yeah. And, and how, how do you go about co-authoring a book? How do you define your roles? Did you each write a chapter? Did you, how do you collaborate in a case like that? Yeah, great question. So I'm the philosopher. Marcus yeah. is the historian. There's no way I could have written a book without a historian of this level. You know? And it's probably such a good book because you didn't have an economist. That's right, nitpicking every little word. Yeah. Um, but uh, what, what we did is, um, you know, the, the book was really my idea. And so I wrote most of it. Marcus really focused on the detailed history chapters having to do both with black atrocities and with black entrepreneurship, where you get down into some of the great narratives and stories of uh, of black success. And so he focused on those chapters. And then I would send him all of my chapters, right? And and sometimes we'd farm it out, you know, to other friends. Check me, make sure I'm not saying anything crazy because I'm not a historian, right? Um, And make it defensible. Uh, uh, I'm more of a big idea person. Marcus is a detailed person. So we worked really, really Good. well together in that regard, which was wonderful. And he was just so encouraging. I'd send him a chapter and he'd say, Rachel, I'm, you know, this is really good. Um, and so it, it gave me energy, you know, to go on to the next one. Um, yeah. So, so that was how we uh, did the exchange and we worked so well together that we're now talking about a follow-up book. So very excited about that. Wonderful. And, and I did notice in the acknowledgements at the back of the book, you, uh, 
uh, express your appreciation to uh, TFAS senior scholar, Jim Otteson, who yes. uh, had you at Wake Forest for a while and is just an outstanding uh, scholar and uh, uh, director of centers and things like that. So I'm glad, uh, I guess he played some role in helping you with. Uh, oh, I would say he played the main okay. role. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because what Jim did is he said, Rachel, do you want to come and I'll buy out a semester of your teaching and you can write a book. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so I actually had that level of focus where I didn't have to work it in, in between yeah. all my classes. I could just really get down to business writing the book. So I'm extremely grateful to Jim for that. And of course, for all his amazing work defending Liberty. Yeah. We can never get enough of him at TFAS. He's either, fantastic. So. <laughs> Now at Notre Dame, of course. Yes. Of course, you talk about classical liberalism. I might start off by talking about capitalism. It, it has a bad reputation, mm. uh, according to surveys at least, particularly among young people. But uh, what about for black Americans? Do you think capitalism is in the interest of black Americans? And then we'll dig down from there. Yeah, well, of course, there's some confusion over the term capitalism, yes. so it depends. Uh, uh, there's crony capitalism, which, of course, I'm against, uh, and, and that's where established interests sort of take advantage of their connections with politicians in order to um, set up, whether it's regulations or subsidies or whatever it might be, that allows them to shut out competitors. And that doesn't yeah. encourage a, a competitive market, and so... Um, we don't like crony capitalism, but if by capitalism we mean a free market, one in which uh, not that winners and losers are chosen by the state, but rather by the consumers, uh, then I think, yes, it's very much in the interest of black Americans. And in fact, I don't think that's an unusual view among black Americans. Uh, I think we saw that when it was uh, Biden versus Bernie in South Carolina, right? We saw that when it was up to the black vote. It was Biden, not Bernie. There's not that much interest in socialism uh, in black America. I think there's a strong entrepreneurial drive. And so even if there may be um, an interest in a thicker welfare state or something like that, in general, black Americans are very pro-capitalist, pro-market, pro-entrepreneurial. Is that opportunity available uh, to most black Americans in our society, which is, I guess, mostly capitalist? I know it's a mixed bag, uh, but we'll say mostly capitalist. Yes, I think it's very much available. And the reason we know that is because half, uh, over half of black Americans are middle class today. Uh, of course, we have stratospherically wealthy black Americans yeah. as well. Um, not Mark Zuckerberg levels, right? So we, so we still have uh, a ways to go. But, um, you know, I think it can be confusing because black Americans are overrepresented under the poverty line. So we have about 10% of white Americans that are under the poverty line and about 20% of black Americans. We actually dipped below for the first time from 2017 to 2019, oh, uh, but right yeah. before COVID, uh, which I think actually did have to do with lowering the corporate tax rate. Uh, that's what Jason Riley said in Black Boom anyway. That was his opinion. Uh, but but we're back up to 20%. And so because there's that overrepresentation, people can get the impression that there's some sort of um, assumption that black people are poor, <laughs> right? But the fact that you have overrepresentation among the poor does not mean that black people in general are poor. This just isn't true. Um, black Americans have made incredible strides, particularly uh, strides, particularly with regard to income. I think the really sticking point now is wealth. And so what we see is that black wealth is still fairly flat. And we want to think about how to encourage wealth accumulation in the black community. But, you know, we're still dealing with the racial hangover of Jim Crow. We're not that far out. And so we have some catching up to do, but we are definitely on a positive trajectory. So in your book, you talk a lot about classical liberalism. Yes. Classical liberal. Could you define that, what, what you mean by classical liberal? And you do devote some time in, I think, chapter one to that concept. And it's, it's a very good chapter. I recommend that chapter alone. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah. But. Yeah, so, of course, the term liberal is also confusing uh, yeah. because we Americans use it in a totally unusual way. We use it in a way that is not true in the rest of the world uh, to mean something like center-left. Uh, but liberal comes from the Latin word liber, which means free, and it has to do with uh, having a form of government who considers the role of government uh, or the primary role of government to be the protection of individual freedom. And so classical liberalism refers to that, and we might distinguish it from welfare liberalism, let's say, of John Rawls or someone like that, uh, more of a 20th century development. And so when we talk about classical liberalism, I try to keep it very simple in the book. I discuss a couple of basic institutions, such as private property, but of course that includes my property in myself, 
And so my own la- I own my labor. I can contract that out for whatever price I choose, etc. cetera. Uh, my, my freedom of contract is very important. So I can contract with whom I please as much as I please. Um, and my equal protection of the rule of just laws. And so if we take those into account, we have a political system which has a very minimal government. Um, There are such things as public goods problems and externalities problems. Those are goods that we do need, but that the market won't provide because of free rider issues and things like that. And so, for instance, national defense, right, would be the classic example there, or maybe uh, uh, pollution when it comes to externalities. But mostly the government is quite minimal. It's going to be dealing with police and courts and so forth. And other than that, you want civil society to step in. So a classical liberal mindset is one in which you want to encourage thick civil society institutions of church and voluntary organization and family and so forth. And then you really want to value what the market can do. That's another form of voluntary exchange, right? Just like civil society is. And so we are very hopeful uh, about what the market can do. And we think we've actually got really good evidence for our hope, uh, given the fact that we now have 8% abject poverty in the in the globe, which is unheard of in human history. Uh, things are going very, very well in that regard, although a lot of people don't know that, um, but it's actually true. And so uh, we think that there could be a renaissance of classical liberal thought if we were really able to appreciate all of its accomplishments. So <clears throat> the classical liberal society is close to what you could say the framers of our constitution were trying to put into place. That's right. Uh, however, they left blacks out of it. That's uh, right. Obviously, not entirely. They le- uh, included the eventual elimination of the slave trade, and many of the framers wanted to abolish slavery uh, while even owning slaves. Uh, but I remember uh, reading something written by David Bowes uh, from the Cato Institute. It was an event there uh, where it it tends to be libertarians who often say, you know, we created this great free society in 1787 in this country. And then ever since then, government's grown, it's gone downhill. And Clarence Thomas was at the meeting and said, well, actually, things are better in America for a lot of us yes. than they were 250 years ago. Talk about that. I mean, uh, Frederick Douglass, Martin Luther King talked about the American founding in a positive way, as, That's right. but it hadn't been fulfilled for black Americans. And you get into that some in this book. Yeah, um, that's one of the one of the arguments that I want to make is to not give into the temptation, which I think perhaps the sixteen nineteen yeah. project gives into this temptation, to think that because of our terrible racial history, which um, we roundly condemn and talk about in in very stark terms, in the book. Um, but but to give into the temptation to think that that means that the whole project is not worth pursuing, and I think that uh, the black pro constitutional tradition shows that right. I mean, going all the way back to people like Prince Hall, who argued for black freedom based on the values of the American project. Uh, People like Phyllis Wheatley, the same thing. Um, And of course, Frederick Douglass, who turned against his own teacher, William Lloyd Garrison, you know, who wanted to give up on the Constitution because of the compromise with slavers. And Frederick Douglass said, no, the Constitution is a great liberty document. It's not the Constitution that's the problem. It's whether Americans have the, the honor, they have honor enough and courage enough to live up to their Constitution. And then, of course, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. talked about the blank check, right, that that we're now bringing to the bank, you know, to, to cash. And so I think that's always been the leverage that oppressed minorities have had in the United States is that we made very bold, revolutionary at the time, claims about the equality of all men. And, you know, I, I make the point in the book, you know, no one said this about Brazil. You know, Brazil brought in 10 times as many West Africans as the United States did. And um, no one's really calling them hypocritical because they didn't make those kinds of claims, right? We were the hypocrites because we made the high claims. And so there's something really wonderful about the fact that America has always had to answer to its own sort of high regard for individual liberty. And did you find in the classical liberal tradition uh, much concern about the plight of black Americans? Yes. throughout that history? <laughs> this was one of the most amazing discoveries that I made in writing the book. Um, 
being in the liberty movement for 25 years, I would have thought I would have known a lot of this, but I didn't. So we don't talk about it enough, guys. We right. need to talk about it more. <laughs> um, but for instance, the whole group of William Lloyd Garrison, uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, that whole crowd, they were all followers of Richard Cobden in England, you know, who was the anti corn law trader, guy. Yeah, yeah, free trader. And the idea was that um, we wanted to use coercion as little as possible. So that's true when it comes to obviously slavery. Slavery, which is inherently coercive, um, but also things like tariffs, which is also inherently coercive, right? And Frederick Douglass actually went to England. He studied under Cobden. He uh, studied the Corn Laws, uh, you know, as a as a kind of uh, template for the way that he was going to work on abolition. And so, little did I know that there was not only a whole strand of pro-black classical liberal thought, but also that it was actually quite effective. It was a really important part of the black story. Uh, this continues into the NAACP. You have a couple of the major founders uh, are serious classical liberals. One of the three mothers of libertarianism, Rose Wilder Lane, sure. uh, wrote for the largest African-American newspaper in the United States uh, with George Shiler, who was a oh, yeah, uh, anti-communist, yeah. right? Yeah. Black editor. Yeah. She said she'd found her people um, at, it was the Pittsburgh Courier, right? Uh, the Pittsburgh Courier. And uh, she wrote against zoning. She wrote against lynching. She wrote, you know, it was all of these individual pro-black kinds of arguments. Uh, you see the same thing with somewhat heterodox thinkers like Zora Neale Hurston, right, who has this strong yeah. individualist strand in her thought that's always made her a little controversial. Um, and so uh, what we found and what we're actually planning to write another book on soon is actually quite a strong tradition of pro-black thought in the classical liberal school. And we also have found, interestingly enough, that we really don't have a lot of virulent racists in the classical liberal tradition. You find some obviously in the conservative, you know, the old Southern agrarian mm -hmm. conservative kind of tradition, and you certainly find it in progressivism, right? You have the terrible Woodrow Wilson and yeah. much of the eugenicist tradition coming out of progressivism, but you really don't have too many um, in, among classical liberals, which which we're very encouraged by. Well, in, in, in as that progressive tradition was in formation and and becoming uh, more into power in this country, was also a time prior to that and through that where black entrepreneurship was also growing in this country. Oh, yes. And uh, there, there was a tremendous amount of that. I guess, I don't know if it's the 1910s, 1920s, but talk about entrepreneurship in the black community historically and the role that may have played in blacks beginning to accumulate some wealth. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Marcus and I talk about the long civil rights movement because we think that Du Bois's way of sort of presenting a desire for economic clout, like Booker T. Washington had, as, as almost opposed to a desire for political rights, we actually think that's a terrible way of approaching mm -hmm. black history. That's not how Booker T. Washington himself thought. Um, obviously, he had to be a little careful with his words. He's in the Deep South. He had uh, assassins were sent to kill him, uh, and people threatened to burn down Tuskegee. Et cetera. So he had to be very careful. But behind the scenes, Booker T. Washington is certainly fighting for political rights. He's funding all kinds of important cases, uh, such as the Pullman Car Company case. But uh, Washington knows that black Americans have to build their economic clout. He's coming out of Hampton Institute, where there was such an emphasis on property rights, on owning property and building that kind of middle and upper income black class that would be able to lift up the rest of the race. And in fact, they did. He was absolutely right. So the National Negro Business League and that whole concept of black self-help where black businesses come together, they support each other, they network with one another. Uh, many of the fraternal associations yeah. were wonderful uh, areas for networking. The black church itself, right, uh, of course, was sort of the hub of it all, the, the um, cultural womb of black America. People were working on these things together and lifting one another up in such a way that you can have the Madam C.J. Walkers and the Annie Malones, right, who are employing thousands upon thousands of people to sell hair care products, making them middle class. Um, Madam C.J. Walker gives the NAACP the largest gift they ever get. So at, at the time, so so the point is, is that there's an actual coalescence of growth of entrepreneurialism and business clout with the growth of political rights. These two things go together. Washington knew that, and Washington played the long game. That's how we see it. Well, then what happened? I mean, you have growing black entrepreneurship. Uh, you have these, as you said, very strong 
fraternal orders, civil society, the black church playing a very role. You write about those in various chapters of this book. Uh, that's all growing up. There's a positive move forward. Of course, Jim Crow still exists and other things, but why didn't that continue? I mean, the yeah. obviously black churches did uh, to a certain extent, maybe not to the extent they served a different purpose at, at different points in history. The fraternal societies seem to have been weakened. Yes. What, what's going on? What a great question. So, yeah, one of the one of the contrasts I draw here is between the period from 1948 to 1966. We actually see black poverty cut in half in this period because there was so much uh, good investment into education, family structure, um, civil society that had occurred. And when that 50s boom happens, black America is able to ride that boom and really be moving towards middle class life. And you really see that flatten yeah. out in the 1970s. And so that whole question of what happened, what happened to family structure? Why is the black church so much weaker? Why are these civil society institutions going? I think there's a lot going on. Um, so let me just mention a few things. Um, uh, but I, I will say primarily I blame the state. <laughs> uh, the states? Uh, the, uh, I, yeah. I blame the state or the state. The, the federal okay. government uh, yeah. is really the big bad wolf in this situation because what you see are things like um, the chipping away of property rights through the federal and contract rights actually through the actions of the Federal Housing Administration. And so not just black people, but immigrants and others were affected by uh, redlining practices, which didn't allow banks to make mortgage loans to people. I mean, they literally said no. And there are stories in the wonderful book, The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein, where banks and developers had their deal and they were ready to go. And the government comes in and says, you may not do this. And so it's incredibly discouraging. But on the heels of that, you have urban renewal and the federal highway system. And this is so destructive, it really can't be overstated. And once again, it affects black Americans and other groups. Other immigrant groups are also affected. And so what you have are these wonderful main streets. You have these... Um, up-and-coming neighborhoods, they may look poor to a middle-class white person of the time, but they were socially mobile. They were moving up. And when the quote-unquote urban renewal, which James Baldwin called Negro removal, uh, right, eminent domain abuse, came through and just flattened these neighborhoods, scattered the people to the four winds. Um, highways were run through major cities, and of course the poorest areas were chosen. And so they were mowed down. Mm -hmm right at the cusp of their, you know, uh, crossing over the line, right, economically into real success. And I think what we need to take into account here is that it's not just your house, right? It's not just your church. It's not just your business. It's the whole network that you've built in the neighborhood, right? It's the civil society capital, the social capital that's destroyed. Now you're in a second ghetto. You're scattered from many of the people that, you know, you've been networked with. And if you're behind a highway, you're also economically isolated. Right. And so literally ghettoized in a certain way. Those who got out, who, those who could get out, did get out, leaving the ones who were the least networked and the least able left really to um, have all of those social investments squandered. And so it's incredibly depressing. Of course, conservatives have, uh, I think, been correct in pointing out the perverse incentives of the welfare state. This is another huge element of this story. Um, this hits the black family very hard, I think, because they were the most vulnerable. Uh, but slowly over time, it's hit other kinds of families just as hard, right? And so out-of-wedlock births are, are very high among black Americans, but also extremely high among Latino Americans, and already much higher among white Americans than they were when Daniel Patrick Moynihan was so worried about it. Um, and that is worrying because uh, marriage and family structure contributes to wealth accumulation in really major ways. So a lot of good things got stopped in a way that is just uh, tragic, really to think about and it's going to take a lot of work to recover and i i would guess with fraternal organizations you had uh the working of you know, i guess gresham's law that uh you know bad money drives out good money and in this case i i guess government played a role in seeing uh in driving fraternal or organizations down because it came in to try to supplant them with government programs? Yeah, so one of the points that we make, you know, the, the term maybe to think about here is the crowd out effect, crowd right? Out, yeah. And so if you have a fraternal organization, let's say whose 
primary role is to provide a kind of insurance. Um, if you get sick, they'll cover you. If you die, they'll help your widow. And everything. Yeah, yeah, with your funeral expenses, things like that. It was a kind of early form of social insurance. And those um, were those were strong in the black community as well literally as, as many as half of black men yeah. in the United States were members of the Black Elks okay. and organizations like this. So they were hugely strong. And and to this day, there's more going on in the black community with fraternal organizations than you have in the white community, but still much much weaker than they were. And I think one of the points we try to make is that there's a kind of um, ripple effect, right? So you have a primary focus of an organization, but there's all these secondary benefits, right? You're getting to know one another, you're networking. Maybe I know you well enough to give you a zero interest loan because I really believe in your business idea or something like that. Once Social Security and those kind of New Deal um, uh, government interventions come into play, when you take away the primary purpose of the organization, oftentimes the organization disappears, but you also lose all those secondary benefits, right? And so once again, it's a destruction of social capital, and I think you can absolutely say that that's what happened. And why do you think, you know, black churches uh, played such a key role before, and yet today they don't seem to be fulfilling that same role? What, what impacted black church was it the fact that they were scattering these communities and uh through the highway and urban renewal programs or were there other things at play there is is i mean we've seen a diminishment of all religious all practice religion. in our society yeah. so that was going on as well yeah, so I always like to quote Glenn Lowry, who says, social science is harder than physics. <laughs> um, so, yeah. so there's so many things going on here at once. What's causing what? And I've thought a lot about the black church, which is still definitely there, still a force, but weaker than it was. And I actually think the causality goes the opposite way from how many people think. So you'll often hear conservatives complain about the black church and say, well, why are marriage rates so low? Or why is out of wedlock birth so high? You know, if uh, so many black people still identify themselves as Christians, still identify with the black church, what happened there? And I actually think that the family was weakened first. Families is what uphold strong churches. And so once you created such a perverse incentive for fathers to be out of the home. Uh, there's there's other parts of the story too. For instance, unions, which were very racist until the last possible minute, finally let black people in. But by then they'd push wages up so high that uh, the jobs went to automation and, and so forth faster than I think they would have otherwise. And so black, very few black men were able to make that transition, you know, from manual labor to, to uh, white collar labor. That puts black men in a really tough position with regard to black women who are being trained for professional jobs like nursing and teaching. Um, there's a lot of, you know, sexual politics being affected by these economic things. And so what I think happened is you have the black community getting hit with everything I just mentioned, right? The destruction of social capital, the, the perverse incentives of, uh, of the welfare state, the, like the jobs, the union, the union jobs, unions. right? Yeah. Um, and, and, and even the contraception shock, which we haven't discussed. This is all hitting the community at once. They're the most vulnerable ones. The family falls first. It happens very fast between the 60s and 70s. And then what is the church supposed to do, right? The, the, the basic structural part of a society is a family, Right. And so once you've undermined the family, that really, really makes it hard for the church to, to function as well as it did. Has there been uh, good work done by economists about uh, the uh, motives behind pushing for higher minimum wages, having a racial dimension to them? Yes. So the work that I drew upon for this section was Illiberal Reformers by Thomas C. Leonard, who goes back and looks at the textbooks of the time at the turn of the century, uh, uh, right around then when eugenics was extremely popular. And of course, most Americans don't realize how popular it was. So we talk about people like Margaret Sanger, uh, mm -hmm. but Margaret Sanger was just one of many, right? Found, I mean, was, founder of Planned Parenthood. Yeah, founder of Planned yeah. Parenthood. But, but she is completely normal for yeah. her time. She's writing letters with John Maynard Kane about eugenics. And he's yeah. saying, you know, now that we've solved the quantity problem, we can move on to the quality problem, right? And he calls eugenics the zenith of modern science. And so um, this is a, a huge fad among social scientists all over the world. Um, and so uh, what we see is that the economists are in on this as well. They're thinking about how to encourage the growth of sort of the Aryan family and discourage the growth of black and immigrant families. 
And so they want to raise wages artificially high, very high, so that the only people that anybody's going to be willing to pay this wage to are going to be obviously English speaking, you know, well groomed, et cetera, um, white American males. They're not educated, well trained. Yeah, exactly. Right. They're they're not going to pay their wives. They're not going to pay their their immigrant or black neighbors. And so um, not only is that the theory, but that's actually made quite clear in the text. It's uh, it's shocking in a way how open the economists are about saying we want to disemploy these groups so that they will fade away out of our society. You uh, talk some in here about the importance of culture for the spontaneous evolution of market market exchange. Uh, I guess I'm I want to ask a question that you know how how do we now move forward from this point? We've seen just this destruction of the family, mm. uh, high levels of out of wedlock birth, fatherless uh, families, uh, dependency on the welfare state, uh, a growth of government, uh, regulation of the economy. Uh, do you have thoughts about how we help lift up minority communities in this country, black and Latino and others and, and, uh, give them opportunity for success and fulfillment of the American promise? I have a few things to say about that. Um, So one thing I would say, I I love to think of the great classical liberal Ludwig von Mises, who who thought at the time that classical liberalism was dead. Uh, There was fascism and communism, and nobody cared about classical liberalism anymore, but he said, I'm just going to keep telling the truth. And so I think for those of us who still believe in small government and still believe in free markets, I think we need to keep telling the truth. You know, supply and demand laws don't change just because it's not popular to talk about at the moment. So I think in terms of things like government regulation, we just need to keep pushing forward um, with with what we know to be the case. Um, But I think when it comes to actually working with these communities that have been so badly destabilized, um, the, the phrase I often use is that the state can cause problems that the state cannot fix. And so what that means is that we have to change our mindset, get away from the progressive addiction to central planning. There's such a desire for there to be a push button solution to something that really requires a spontaneous order solution, meaning it has to come up from below. And so what I talk about in the book is neighborhood stabilization. Um, This is a kind of thinking that's actually been going on for decades. Um, John Perkins of the Christian Community Development Association, uh, Robert Lupton's wonderful book, Uh, Toxic Charity, about the work he did in Atlanta, Uh, Brian Fickert's book, When Helping Hurts, of course, the great Bob Woodson in Washington, D.C. What we find are people who have been thinking about what you do when a neighborhood has become so destabilized that there are, for instance, over 20 percent empty houses in the neighborhood. Maybe there's very little employment, uh, a lot of government dependency, very little marriage, et cetera. And what they found is that it really takes eight to 10 years to stabilize a block. Um, you need someone with an almost missionary heart, right? Whether it's a person from the neighborhood or from outside who's willing to dedicate themselves to uh, gaining the trust of the neighbors, living with people, walking through life with people. And what you find is that if that practitioner comes in with the attitude that the neighbors actually know what they want for their block, they actually have a vision for their own life. Mm -hmm. It's just that they've kind of been voiceless, right? They've sort of given up hope because of the milieu. What you're able to do is simply empower them, simply listen to them, right? Simply help them get organized, but really subjugate your own ideas about what needs to happen in the neighbor, uh, to the neighborhood, to, to their ideas, because they're the ones who know. And, uh, we've seen amazing success with this model. Eight to 10 years might seem like a long time, but we've been doing these destructive progressive policies for 60 years and they're getting worse, not better, right? Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. better to just get on the ground and start investing in these kinds of projects. But what that means for us as donors, as members of churches and mission boards and volunteers is that we need to flip our philanthropic mindset and think more about how we can invest in charity that raises people's dignity and helps them to become self-sufficient as opposed to things that make us feel good, but it's sort of like drive by poverty tourism. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's, there's a kind of spiritual discipline involved in saying no to things that are going to create dependency, you know, maybe help you get through till next Tuesday, but not really be transformative for you and putting the time and love that it takes into something that's going to be really transformative. 
Uh, that's excellent. We, we developed a program at TFAS uh, in 1999. Uh, we held it at uh, Indiana University's uh, Indianapolis campus, IUPUI, and it was called the Institute on Philanthropy and Voluntary Service. And mm. we, we, the inspiration was our, one of our founders and our longtime president, my predecessor, David Jones. He came from a small town in West Virginia. Mm. And he used to tell the story of, you know, if, if they needed a little league field for the kids to play on, the American Legion post would go out and clean a vacant lot up mm -hmm. and put up a backstop and bases and build the little field. They wouldn't look to Washington, D.C. to, yeah. uh, to, to get a grant. And uh, so we, our program was focused, we, we purposely didn't do it in Washington, D.C. because we didn't want the focus on the federal government. We wanted on local communities. And Indianapolis has a lot of great charities and local philanthropy. And for some you know, 10 years, we would put students in small nonprofit organizations, community charities, and try to impress on them that lesson that the true solutions are Tocquevillian solutions found at the local level right. of people solving problems. Uh, eventually, that program ended, and hopefully not permanently, because I think that's a lesson that all too many young people think you look to Washington for solutions. Right. You're involved in something in, in Missouri, uh, Love the Lou. Yes. Is that part of this? Yes. What, what is it? Tell us about that organization. Yes. Love the Lou is um, a, a neighborhood stabilization organization run by my friend Luc Lucas Rugley, who moved on to Enright Boulevard about 12 years ago. Um, took him about six years for everybody to get used to him being there, <laughs> right? And and believe that he wasn't going to leave, right? And yeah. wasn't going to abandon them, even even if his van got stolen a couple times, <laughs> right? Um, but he stuck to it. And uh, he's now on his second neighborhood. And right, has been stabilized, which we, which means not only that it's full of beautiful community gardens and many of the houses have been rehabbed, um, but it means that students are going to college or getting jobs. They're not joining gangs. They're not going to jail. Uh, many of the adults are now stabilized as well. And so that that neighborhood is on its way. Um, one of the women who was involved in, in Love the Lou, Tawana, is really sort of running that end of things now. And so he's handed it over to her in many ways. Um, and then the new neighborhood, which is right between Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue and Page Avenue in St. Louis on Taylor, we now have a resource center with a church and community center that's bringing four neighborhoods together. This is where Chuck Berry and Tina Turner and, you know, some of these great singers yeah. uh, came from, right, and where they were discovered. Uh, and yet, you know, you go down there and you wouldn't know it, right? You wouldn't know that there's such this amazing history. And so there's a lot of work to do in terms of breaking down some of the invisible sort of territorial barriers between neighbors and things like that. But what we find is that if you stick around and you love people and you don't give up, uh, many of those things begin to fade over time and people begin to trust you. They begin to tell you their hopes and dreams. And pretty soon you can help them start businesses. You can help them get into good jobs and begin to stabilize their lives. Um, so I tell some success stories in the book about, you know, Michelle who started Pimped Out Pickles, right? Which are these great flavored pickles. They're <laughs> delicious. And they're in all the grocery stores in St. Louis now, right? Or Tiffany who started her own in-home daycare. Um, what do you need. You need a network of people just like you and I have and take for granted, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody you call when you don't understand taxes, somebody you call when you need to figure out QuickBooks. You need that, but in an area where it's gone, right? And so we as middle and upper income people don't necessarily have to move to the inner city like Lucas Rugley did, right? That's his special calling, but we can be the network that he brings in as mentors, as somebody that, that can be relied upon for these inner city entrepreneurs, for these young men, for young dads who are trying to raise their kids and do something different from what their dads did. Do, um, yeah. Do you sometimes have to take on government created barriers to entry? And, you know, these, you, I hear the stories of the Institute of Ju for Justice of, you know, regulations that prevent people from starting a salon that's going to braid hair yeah, building, yeah. making caskets for funerals and right. uh, all sorts of things that, that state wants licensing or, you know, creates these barriers. Have, have you had to tackle some of those in oh, St. Yeah. Louis? Or, oh, yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. Um, we actually had the Institute for Justice come in in Pagedale, which is a, a tough neighborhood where uh, once um, Eric Schmidt had dealt with the 
taxation by citation problem with driving where people were just getting ticketed to support the police. Um, They switched to citing people for things in their houses. So if you had a basketball hoop in the front yard or, you know, your shades weren't right or, you know, it was ridiculous and people were getting thousands of dollars in in fines. Um, Then when they couldn't pay and they would be too afraid to go to court and then they'd get worse fines and it was snowballing. And the Institute for Justice came in and actually successfully sued Page Dale. And so, yes, we've absolutely experienced that. And big shout Shout out to my friends at the uh, Freedom Center of Missouri who do economic justice cases in Missouri as well. Yeah, good. Well, what what would you say uh, about uh, whether markets uh, incentivize good behavior and moral behavior? Do do markets play a role in uh, incentivizing you know the proper behavior among people, and that maybe that's another reason why uh, markets could be a positive for low income people for all of us really yeah I absolutely just, yeah. so i'm a i'm a big aristotelian i love aristotle and um, one of the points he makes when he talks about virtues is that some things that may you may not think of when you think of virtues really are virtues so Uh, What do I mean? When we think of virtue, we think of these big, you know, courage, right? These big, great sounding things. But actually, you need things like friendliness. You need things, you need polite you know, etiquette, right? Why? Because it smooths, it greases the wheels of social interaction. And so what markets do is they help us to um, tolerate one another, to, um, you know, put up with one another, but also to kind of be, um, you know, it doesn't matter if it's a little fake. That's okay, right? We don't we don't want everybody to tell everybody else what they think. You know, I, I think of Rousseau saying, oh, you know, we're all so artificial and it's not authentic. And I'm thinking, <laughs> Rousseau, do you know how terrible it would be if we all came right out and said what we thought about everybody? Everybody, that would be awful. We'd be at war with one <laughs> yeah. another, right? So there's nothing wrong with repressing some of that, you know, right. when you're out in the world. And so markets encourage us to deal with one another, whether I like you or not, whether you're part of my group or not, right? Whether you're part of my religious community or my family ties or my neighborhood, I'm still going to do business with you because we've got exchange for mutual advantage. And so I think sometimes that subtle sort of virtue can be taken for granted because it has a dispersed effect. Right. So it's not like the courageous soldier who goes in and dies for his country and you can point right at his his sacrifice. Right. Instead, it's just all of these little things that we do throughout every day, making contracts with one another, you know, waving at each other in traffic, um, you know, talking to the uh, the guy who's checking you out at the grocery store. Those sorts of habits of interaction actually play an incredible role in having a peaceful society that lends itself to advantageous exchange and makes we make one another richer but uh it's easy to miss so markets uh encourage that behavior do they also disincentivize discriminatory behavior at the same time that's certainly um that's certainly uh beckett's idea right or becker's idea sorry gary becker's idea um so there's a little bit of a debate between robert higgs and gary becker where gary becker is talking about the fact that you have to pay to discriminate so there's a cost yeah there's a cost if somebody is not as um polished as somebody else um you might be able to pay them a little less right but bring them in and and it can be advantageous for both of you if you want to discriminate against them for not being as polished or or not having as good of language skills or whatever it might be then you'll have to pay for that right by hiring someone at a higher rate so i think becker's right and higgs thinks Mm -hmm. becker's right but higgs just says don't let that make you think that markets will magically solve all discrimination because the fact is sometimes people are so prejudiced that they will pay And you saw that, right? You saw that in the post-emancipation economy. However, um, Higgs, a wonderful book that I draw on a lot um, on on the post-emancipation economy, he does point out that in order to maintain that discrimination in the South and the rise of white supremacy, they did have to put in a ton of laws. Uh, They tried to form cartels so people couldn't leave and work for somebody else and bid up their shares. It didn't work, right? Because cartels are unstable. Um, They had to pass municipal laws, state laws, federal laws to try and keep people apart who would naturally live together. And so on the one hand, yes, people can be that prejudiced and really pay the price for it. But on the other hand, they often really can't maintain it unless they can bring coercion in to keep it going. And that's what was so evil about the Jim Crow 
uh, laws and the and the whole reign of white supremacy is that it was actually uh, embracing a kind of big government government intervention sort of attitude so that you could make something happen that wasn't naturally happening. Interesting. Well, this has been great. Uh, you're at Chicago Concordia and yes. uh, uh, but living in Saint, the St. Louis area and uh, those students at Concordia who take your classes are certainly fortunate. Oh, thank and you. As will, I hope they agree. As, as, yeah, as will be our students uh, tonight at, uh, at George Mason University's uh, Market uh, Mason Square campus when they get to hear you tonight uh, with Ann Bradley. So thank you for much, so much for joining me today on this Liberty and Leadership podcast, Rachel. It's been great. I You're recommend welcome. very much that everyone uh, find this book on Amazon or elsewhere, uh, published by Emancipation Press. That's right. The same publisher uh, who publishes Hill, Bob Woodson. The division yeah. of Post Hill. Yep. Uh, it's Black Liberation Through the Marketplace, Hope, Heartbreak, and the Promise of America. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Liberty and Leadership Podcast. Please don't forget to subscribe, download, like, or share the show on Apple, Spotify, or YouTube, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you like this episode, I ask you to rate and review it. And if you have a comment or question for the show, please drop us an email at podcast at tfas.org. The Liberty and Leadership Podcast is produced at K Global Studios in Washington, D.C. I'm your host, Roger Ream. And until next time, show courage in things large and small.